Hey guys, this presentation is on venous ulcer, patient assessment and management. A 65-year-old woman has a 7cm ulcer with a slowy base, situated above the medial malleolus. There is brownish pigmentation of her left lower calf. How would you manage her? So my provisional diagnosis for this lady is a venous ulceration. This is due to chronic venous stasis secondary to either incompetent venous valves causing reflux, deep vein thrombosis resulting in chronic obstruction, or inadequate muscle pump function. My differential diagnosis is, includes arterial ulceration from chronic arterial insufficiency, neuropathic ulceration, most likely secondary to diabetes mellitus or chronic vitamin B12 deficiency, malignancy such as skin cancers, vasculitis, um, connective tissue diseases like scleroderma. And it's important to note that sometimes the patient may have both venous and arterial um, disease and both of these are contributing towards the ulceration. So in this situation it's important to manage the arterial disease um, before you manage the venous. And ulcer will not heal until you address all the contributive causes. So in terms of history, I would first take symptoms um, suggestive of chronic venous insufficiency, assess for risk factors, exclude the differentials, and assess for any medications which may continue to interfere with wound healing. So in terms of symptoms of chronic venous insufficiencies, these include, these can be summarized as vulsa, venous ulcers. So V stands for varicosities along the legs, um, and often these are just enlarged superficial venous veins, and these cause reflux, and they're large because the deep vein, um, so all the blood pools in the varicosities. Um, ulceration, uh, you want to ask about the time, the onset, the progress and the treatments thus far for the ulcer on the patient's leg. You want to assess for any leg pain, tied heavy legs and venous claudication. Assess for the color of the leg and external trophic features such as derm lipodermatosclerosis, atrophy blanche, stasis dermatitis, which is basically a dry, scaly, erythematous, weeping skin. And from the history, it sounds like from her brownish discoloration that she may have lipodermatosclerosis. She may also have edema and eczema, reticular veins, and telangiectasias. Risk factors for venous insufficiency include increasing age, smoking, history of deep vein thromboses, um, either due to pelvic pelvic surgeries or thrombophilic disorders. Obesity, again, it increases the weight in the abdomen area and increases the venous hypertension. Family history is an important factor for um, venous reflux and incompetent valves. You want to exclude differentials, for example, arterial insufficiency, um, diabetes mellitus, which can lead to neuropathic ulcers, skin malignancies, um, if they have a history of immunosuppression, um, and vasculitis, systemic sclerosis, uh, SLE, and um, altered immune system limits the wound healing. And in terms of medications, steroids, chemotherapy agents, lefthunamide interfere with wound healing. On examination, you want to first do the patient's vitals, looking at their blood pressure, heart rate, and BMI, especially the BMI because high BMI is associated with venous hypertension. Then you want to assess the um, patient's lower limbs, do a peripheral vascular examination, looking at the ulcer, thinking about the size, shape, surrounding skin, border base, and location, and look for the valsa signs, which I mentioned before. Again, varicosities, ulceration, leg pain, color, and external trophy trophic features, edema, eczema, reticular veins, and telangiectasias. You'd also want to do a cardiovascular exam um, to look at the heart and peripheral vascular disease just to see whether they have any arterial disease because it determines the suitability and the degree of compression stockings they may need. And endocrine exam if, you, if they have diabetes, diabetes mellitus and you want to look for any changes such as acanthosis nigricans, which is a darkish um, discoloration and thickening of the skin at um, areas such as the armpit and antecubital fossa. So telangiectasias, this is what they look like. They're basically dilated red blood vessels on the skin and it may suggest venous disease. If you see them on the chest, they may indicate um, chronic liver disease. 
lipodermatosclerosis is what this looks like. Um, and basically it's due to the continual chronic extravasation of red blood cells which break down within the extracellular matrix releasing the hemoglobin. Then the macrophages take up this hemoglobin and then the, the iron particles remain within the macrophages forever causing this um, golden brown um, bronze color discoloration of the skin. And the arrows here actually point to atrophy blanche. In terms of venous ulcer, um, they're often located in the medial malleolus, whilst the arterial ulcers are located on the lateral malleolus. So in terms of investigation, um, you don't really need any investigations to diagnose an ulcer because it's quite clear on examination. However, in order to diagnose venous stasis, a duplex ultrasound would be useful because you're able to look at the blood flow, look for any obstruction and valvular reflux. You want to assess the degree of arterial disease by doing an ankle brachial index, and this involves taking the um, systolic blood pressure in both arms and both legs and then developing one from each side of the body, left and right. Um, duplex ultrasound, again, will be useful for arterial disease. Um, angiography, it's possible for um, arterial disease with an intention to treat, such as balloon angioplasty. Um, and in terms of very last line, you can do a CT venography or a CT abdopelvis, look for pelvic malignancy. However, these are only in situations which you suspect um, or when the duplex ultrasounds and the previous investigations yield no useful findings. So in terms of the management for venous ulcer, in summarization, you treat the wound with a six E's have pharmacological treatment, treat the venous disease, and treat the arterial disease and associated risk factors. So let's go through these in more detail. So in terms of treating the wound with six E's, you want elevation, exercise, extra tight graduated compression stockings, 30 to 40 millimeters mercury, emollient or moisturizer, excellent management of the underlying risk factors such as smoking, and excellent wound care. Elevation, you want the leg to be elevated above the heart level or at the heart level for 30 minutes three to four times a day. This improves cutaneous microcirculation and reduces edema. In terms of exercise, you want to have daily walking, gentle ankle flexion and dorsiflexion exercise to promote the calf muscle pump and return venous um, supply. And then you want graduated knee-high stockings and this is essential um, and we'll talk about this later. In terms of amyloid and moisturizer, you need this to prevent the eczema skin changes, which is mostly due to dryness and stasis dermatitis. You can also put on topical corticosteroids as ointment. Um, and excellent wound care, you want to make it slightly moist environment by putting hydrogel. You can put on zinc, this promotes healing, and you want to change every one to two days depending on the degree of exudate. More changing if there's more exudate to keep it into a slightly moist environment and if severe back dressings or skin grafts. In terms of pharmacological, you can give pain management because a lot of these ulcers are quite painful if it's not neuropathic ulcers, and antibiotics if you suspect that it is infected. However, often something that looks like cellulitis is not infected, and if you treat the um, ulcer disease, it removes the, um, the pinkish erythematous changes in the legs. Um, and you want to try and stop medications which prevent wound healing, such as corticosteroids, antineoplastic drugs like chemotherapy and leflonamide. You can treat the venous disease either using sclerotherapy, which is minimally invasive, or surgery, which includes saphenectomy. And if they have underlying arterial disease, you want to treat it with either arterial stenting or balloon angioplasty or open alt surgery to remove the um, endorectomy cease smoking and treat any hypertension and hypercholesterolemia to prevent the progression of currently existing atherosclerosis. So just be careful with compression um, stockings. Compression therapy can cause harm, especially if you don't recognize that they also have underlying arterial disease. And contraindications for hypercompression, um, which is 25 to 35 millimeters mercury, is an arterial is an ankle brachial index below 0.6 unless it's guided by a specialist. Lower limb edema, that's oedema caused by cardiac, renal, or liver failure, suspected deep vein thrombosis before anticoagulation, because if you put on compression stockings, this may dislodge the DVT and this may cause a saddle embolus or 
the arterial blood is just not able to return back into the heart and so more arterial blood goes into the um, leg without being able to drain down and essentially you've created a compartment syndrome um, like situation. Um, so there is a balance between the ankle brachial index, so the arterial insufficiency and compression stockings. So arterial um, ABI less than 0 0.6 do not do con do not do compression stockings. They need treatment. They need to improve their ABI. Um, if their ABI is between 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 or they have diabetes, you can think about putting them on a lower degree of compression stockings, such as 18 to 24 millimeters mercury in a multidisciplinary multidisciplinary specialist leg ulcer clinic with close monitoring and it's safe to have 25 to 35 millimeters mercury of compression if they have an ABI of 0 0.8 to 1.2. It's important to note that it, ABI needs to be repeated regularly as it can progress um, during time if they're not properly managed with their high antihypertensives and anticholesterolemia and, uh, and hypercholesteremia. Um, and just be careful, if the ABI is above 1.3, it may actually be falsely elevated, especially in those with diabetes, obesity, and renal failure. So in terms of long-term management, you want to prevent the recurrence of leg ulcers. And essentially, this is the sustained use of graduated compression stockings. And it's been found that the higher the degree of compression, but maximum 40 millimeters mercury, the lower risk of recurrence. Um, if patients find it difficult to apply compression stockings of such degrees, they can think about having a lower compression stocking, 1824 millimeters mercury, or long-term compression bandaging using elastic or inelastic. Um, bandages. So essentially they're on graduated compression therapy forever um, and often 60% of venous leg ulcers heals with co just compression therapy alone in six months. Um, however, 70% of venous leg ulcers recur in five years if you stop the compression therapy. Um, if people don't like graduated compression therapy, you can also think about an adjunct such as intermittent pneumatic compression devices. Um, however, this is quite uh, expensive and difficult to use because you need a machine, you need to like put it on both legs and it like intermittently squeezes your legs, um, which is much more expensive um, than the graduated compression therapy. But it's useful um, for those who can't handle graduated compression therapy. Um, in terms of scler surgery and sclerotherapy, this aims to reduce the venous hypertension. And it's only really useful if the venous incompetence is superficial and in the perforator system. Because there's no way that you can use surgery or sclerotherapy if the deep venous um, system is not working. And often the deep venous system is fine. It's the superficial ones that are problematic. So sclerotherapy is often ultrasound guided and the sclerosing agent is injected into the vein to treat the venous disease. Um, it's quite useful for large varicose veins, saphenofemoral and saphenopopliteal junction incompetence. Saphenectomy or endovenous ablation are surgical techniques um, using junctional ligation, stripping or stabbed lobotomy. Um, and this is when they, you can identify the site of reflux and it's localized and you do this and it treats it. So this is what endovenous vasc laser treatment looks like. They basically insert a fiber optic laser into the diseased vein, such as this one, and then the laser energy causes the vein to collapse, and gradually the laser is slowly withdrawn and the vein closes. And the vein essentially becomes this harmless fibrous tissue that gradually gets absorbed. And so the, the blood is now able to go through the deep venous system up to the heart rather than getting lodged and thrombosed in stasis within the superficial venous system. In terms of skin care, um, a lot of people with uh, chronic venous hypertension have dermatitis and dryness is the most common cause of dermatitis. And so if you just treat the dryness, it essentially reduces the risk of dermatitis and itchiness and pain. But just giving them a simple emulant glycerol, 10% in sorbolin, um, greater than once daily application. You don't want it to have any fragrances um, because this may irritate the skin. You can also consider putting moderate to potent topical corticosteroid. Um, 
um, such as methylprednisolone 0.1% in ointment one to two times daily until the skin is clear. A lot of people worry that this may induce skin atrophy, however this is rarely a problem with the topical corticosteroids um, and you can apply in the skin around the ulcer and up to the edge of the ulcer but not in the ulcer itself. You also want to avoid the patient using any soaps or antiseptics, astringents or fragrances because this will irritate, irritate the dermatitis. So in patients who have delayed healing of venous ulcers or failure to heal at all, you can, you've got to start thinking about comorbidities that may delay the healing and reduce the level of compression. For example, if they have cardiac failure or diabetes, this often results in a delayed healing. Um, if they have mixed venous and arterial disease, and risk factors include an ulcer that's very large, so greater than 5 centimeters squared, or ulceration lasting for more than six months because of the chronic changes, popliteal reflux, and chronic, chronic ulcer recurrence. So just um, as a side note to compare arterial versus venous ulcers. So arterial ulcers often occur in the toes, foot, and ankle. The ulcers are more punched out and well-defined, and the wound bed is covered in the slough and necrotic tissue. The size is usually small, and there's a low level of exudate, and it is very, very painful. In contrast, venous ulcers are usually in the medial malleolus region, and the edges are sloping and gradual. The wound base is covered in slough. Slow. Um, the size is usually quite large, with a high amount of exudate, um, but there is minimal pain. And so this slide goes into further detail about the different other types of venous ulcers, which are less um, common, but it's very important to keep in mind as well. So you have neuropathic leg ulcers, and these are often in areas of pressure because these patients cannot feel um, where they have pain. And the size and shape can be variable, and it has a regular margin. The edge, again, is like a tiro in, being, in it being punched out, and it has a slowy base. In terms of traumatic, often it's a site of trauma, um, and it's very variable in terms of size and shape. In terms of malignant ulcers, um, these are those which you can find on the face, lips or tongue, um, and the edge um, is averted or rolled out, and the floor often has a black mass. So if you see any of these signs, you start thinking about maybe this isn't just venous or an arterial ulcer, but it could be neuropathic, traumatic, or malignant. Thank you. So that's um, that's a presentation on.